Bibles? Anybody bring a Bible? I mean, for you, you can bring Bibles. I know you can read off the screen. But it's nice to have a little marker so you can mark it as you go. In Numbers 11, we're going to talk today about the strategies of God. No matter what your situation you're in or what you're facing, God has a strategy. Would you say that with me? God has a strategy. And in this story that we're going to read, uh, Moses was having a particularly bad day, so bad he was praying to die. And when you pray to die, you're having a pretty bad day. But you know, God had an interesting strategy to help Moses out. Numbers 11, verse 4. The rabble who were among them, that are out in the wilderness here, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to eat free in Egypt, cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlics, but now our appetite's gone. There's nothing at all but this manna. They have a short memory, don't they? They don't remember the whips on their backs and the horrible slave masters. They just remember a couple of good things here. Skip down to verse 10. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the doorway of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. And so Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you've laid all the burden of all this people on me? Verse 14. I alone am not able to carry this burden, all this people because it's too burdensome for me. So if you're going to deal with me like this, Please kill me at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. Now, things are pretty bad when the leader's praying to die, and we laugh, but a few of us can probably relate to a day or two where we feel, we need to pray to die, but how many can understand a little bit of bad, you have a bad day? Now, verse 16, the Lord starts talking about strategy. The Lord, there's poor, said to Moses, gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. And that I will come down and speak with you there and I will take of the spirit who is on you and will put him upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you shall not bear it alone. And the Lord has an interesting idea, an interesting solution. He says, I know a way to help. Evidently, more anointed people can carry burdens. When there's more, God's strategy for your life is more of the anointing of God on your life, more of the presence, both for you and for everybody around you. Before you check me out and I said, oh, I thought that you had something concrete. Well, he isn't concrete, but he made the concrete. Yeah. We're talking something real here. Everybody say the Holy Spirit's real. This was a real solution to a real problem. And watch how it goes here, verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took of the spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Elbad and the other Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. Now they were among those 70 who had been registered, but they not got up to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Holy Ghost wildfire. Hallelujah. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all God's people, all the Lord's people, were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. What is Moses saying? He said, it's fine with me if all three million of you are anointed. It's a wonderful thing to be anointed of God. Of course, we know, if Moses was saying, may all God's people be anointed, there were about three, four million of them. That was ultimately God's plan, was for everybody yeah. in the body of Christ to carry the anointing of God. Moses said, what a wonderful world it would be if all God's people were anointed. Now, before you say, oh, are you saying I'm, you're not anointed? No, you are anointed. I want you to know you're anointed. And I want you to know that the answer to the problems that you face is more of the anointing of God in your life. Because the anointing is a burden remover and a yoke destroyer. The anointing is a problem solver. He's a person called the Holy Spirit of God. 
The name of today's lesson is Who is the Holy Spirit? All of us who love God, now think about this, this is so true. All of us who love God look to those who carry his anointing to help us know the Lord better. Now, is that true or not? I mean, I, I run into this conference down in Hampton every year, camp meeting, they have Mark Hankins in. I'm not, I'm not crazy about Mark Hankins, I'm crazy about that anointing he carries. Whoa, a yoke, a burden removing, yoke breaking anointing. Amen? All of us who love God look to those who carry his anointing to help us know the Lord better. But I want to tell you today that you are anointed and the Lord wants you to seek that anointing. Both for your sake and for the sake of the people around you. This is an exciting lesson. This yeah. is awesome. Look at 1 John 2, 20 and 27. You have to turn there. But John said, you, he's writing to the church. He's writing to you. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Seven verses later, he says it again. As for you, the anointing you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, that is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. So he is saying to you, you as a Christian have an anointing, and that anointing, that person, is doing his very best to teach you. He said, abide in him the way he teaches you to. God wants his Holy Spirit to rest upon you and me in an ever-increasing measure. So we're going to take some time and ask, who is the Spirit of the Lord? Who is this one that Jesus told us would take his place? If you'll turn to John 16 and 7. Now. The reason it's a little bit of a challenge to talk about, to teach about the Holy Spirit, if Jesus were here and he said, I'd just like to spend one week with anybody that would like to get to know more about me, oh. how many hands would go? We'd all say, me, me, me. But he said, look, I can't be here, but I will send someone in my place. So how many of you would like to get to know the one he's sending in place? Hallelujah. Yeah, thank you. That'd be better enough. Look at John 16, verse 7. Jesus is speaking the night of his betrayal. He told his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Incomprehensible to them at the moment. To your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He said, it is advantageous for you that I go back to heaven so that the Holy Spirit, who has no bodily limitations, can come and live his life in you and through you. Look at John 14, 16, just a chapter back. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. He was telling his 12 disciples, the Holy Spirit has been walking with you the whole time because of the anointing on my life. You've been walking with him, but when you can get born again, as soon as I'm raised from the dead, he will be in you. Moses said, oh, that the anointing of God would rest on all three million of you. And guess what? Jesus made a way for that to happen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, part of the reason, we'll take a little aside here, I do despise Halloween. I don't dislike Halloween, I despise it. Because when people start celebrating the root of all heartache, I mean, that is not right. The demonic spirits that they want to revel in for a little short time there are the demonic spirits that cause the disease that took their loved ones. I mean, this is not right. Anyhow, I was in this same Bible yesterday, and I just looked up Spirit to see, I didn't have my big reports with me, no, to see what, where, how many listened to the Holy Spirit. They gave a definition of Spirit, and this is one of the definitions, listen to this. One definition of Spirit in the Bible Concordance is a supernatural being or essence, usually evil. I thought, what? Usually evil? No. Not in my, not in my ballpark. Not my home. Not my world. The spirit I know is, is that spirit that David prayed that said, oh, let your good spirit lead us. The spirit I know is absolute goodness. Amen. Now, wait a minute. There are evil spirits, but the dominant spirit in our lives is the very essence of goodness. And maybe since this yeah. is Halloween, it would be good. We're going to take two minutes to tell you where demons came from. Yeah. It's in the Bible, go to Revelation 12. 
Lucifer was created good. Lucifer was one of the three archangels, and Gabriel, Michael, and there used to be Lucifer. He was the shining one who led worship in heaven. He led a rebellion, and one out of three of the good angels followed him and became demons. Revelation 12, 7. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. Now, why does it say the dragon and his angels? Well, it left out the word fallen. The, the writer of, of, of the apocalypse, the revelation, is assuming that you know that the dragon leads the fallen angels, okay? So anytime you hear of a fallen angel, it is a demon. So, Michael and his angels waged war with the dragon, and the dragon and the demons waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels, or fallen angels, were thrown down with him. Now, the, let's read verse 10 too. It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of our Christ, his Christ has come. Why? For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. That will be a great day. Yeah. It will be a great day when you no longer have to resist that voice of condemnation that's just always whispering in your ear saying, oh, what a jerk you are. You ever heard that one? You know? That'll be a great day. But there's coming, my point is, there's coming a day of absolute defeat of the accuser of the brethren and all the fallen demons, or fallen angels or demons. Now, there's one thing I want you to know. There's so much glorification of, of the demonic this one week. I want you to know that no evil spirit can ever do anything in your life without your permission. Amen. It's terribly important. Now, we see headlines of people who have done some unthinkable things while under the influence of uh, demonic spirits. But they had to uh, submit to that or that would not have happened. And the best illustration, nobody gets the idea on their own to go cut somebody up or cook them. Or, I mean, just unbelievable. That came straight from Satan himself. But not one of those people had to do it. I'm going to give you a real fast illustration. Uh, Dr. Lester Summerall was a great giant of faith. In the Philippines, there was a lot of demonic activity on this one island that a woman had a, was really demon possessed and people were afraid of her. And she was in jail and was still manifesting. So they said, would you please come cast the devil out of this woman? And he did. And after he did, he said, do you want to get born again, honey? She said, yeah. And she got saved. She became a Christian. You realize nobody is beyond the blood of Jesus. Okay. She became a Christian in the church. And one day Dr. Summer will ask her, he said, I've always wanted to ask something. It seemed to me like about everything the devil told you, you did. He said, why didn't he ever tell you to kill somebody? And he, she said, oh, he did many times. He said, now you didn't act out on that one. She said, no, I told him I would not do that. Now here's a woman, so wacky, so demon possessed. She's got bite marks on her when nothing's biting her. She was really demon possessed. But she, in her unsafe state, was able to draw a line on the devil and said, no, I draw a line. I'm going to kill somebody. Now, if she can do that, you as a blood-washed child of the living God, don't tell me you can't live holy. You just tell me I draw the line right there because we all draw the line somewhere. Hallelujah. So there are some evil spirits parading around. It doesn't take a genius to know that. They are trying to influence people. But the Bible says... Greater is the one who lives in us than the one who lives in the world. I want to examine that verse. You know, we flip it off real easy. Greater is the one who lives in me. Look at 1 John 4, 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, this is what I love about this verse. He didn't put a greater angel on you. I mean, that would have been better than a, than a fallen angel, but you know who he put in you? The uncreated creator of everything lives in us. The uncreated creator of all that you know lives in you. I don't ever want, I mean, I just refuse to discuss fear. If you're a blood-washed child of God, you have authority over the enemy. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to anoint our lives, empower us to live like Jesus, and use us to lead others out of darkness. He he wants to anoint us to heal and to encourage. And this is what's 
challenging to my thinking, okay? I know that if the Lord Jesus Christ volunteered to walk with any one of you this week and speak to your friends with you and lay hands, he says, okay, you lay hands on this side, I'll lay hands on the other side and pray and they'll be healed. You'd be fine with that. But if he says, okay, there's no, there can only be one of me if I'm there in the flesh, so I will send my spirit. And I'll, I'll lay hands on them when you lay hands on them because I'm in you. Right. All of a sudden, people start backpedaling and think, well, that's weird. But why is that weird? They're, he's giving Moses what he wanted. Moses said, all oh, that all God's people were anointed. And as a pastor, I say, oh, that all of us were anointed. Because the anointing helps you to think straight. The anointing gives you joy when otherwise you'd be down in the depths speaking negative. Do you know what the disciples asked about Jesus Christ when he stopped a life-threatening storm? Mark 4.41, you know the story, won't read the whole story, but it's a horrible storm. And when it stopped, it says they, the disciples, became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, they've been walking with him, yeah. but it occurred to them they didn't know. Right. And I would like to respectfully submit to you that the best question you could ask is, Who then is this Holy Spirit? Who's come to take up residence in me? Jesus got that question asked about him all the time. John 8, 25, the Pharisees were talking to him, and they were saying to him, Who are you? And Jesus said, What have I been saying from the beginning? They knew he was somebody, right? Pilate looked at him and said, Who are you? Are you a king? The reason you're here is because you asked that question, and you decided with Peter, You are the Christ, the Son yes. of the living God. Amen. Now, if you, if you will ask that same question, the Holy Spirit. Who in the world are you? You know his presence. And you say, how do you know that if you're saved, you know the witness of being born again? You know, you, you, you know inside your knower. You're born again. And that's him just saying, it's okay. You're good. How many of you got that witness? You died right now. It wouldn't be a problem. You'd be, okay, that's the Holy Spirit. You know him. But today we're going to say, who in the world are you? Hallelujah. Okay, Romans 8, 11. We'll start there. If we knew who lived in us, we wouldn't be afraid to do anything for God. I'm going to say that 15 more times. If we really knew who was in us, we wouldn't worry what people thought. There's people dying and going to hell. We don't have time to worry what people think. Amen. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who indwells you. Yeah. So the first thing we see is that, you see, this is the mightiest in all of creation. From eternity past to eternity future, the mightiest act God has ever done is to raise Jesus from the dead. Because when he created the heavens and the earth, there was no opposition. He simply said, light be, and he created. But when he offered himself as a sacrifice, and all the demons of hell tried to hold him in that grave. He had to overcome all of his enemies, all demonic opposition in one moment of time. He overcame everything. And the most explosive burst of power was not the atomic bomb. It was God the Holy Spirit bursting every enemy of, of the cross off of Jesus and raising him to life. And that same explosive power lives in every one of us. Amen. Amen. When you tell me I just can't overcome depression, you can if you decide to. Yeah. And you say, how, how do you do that? You get inside here this word and you find out what he says and then you announce it like God has yeah. Reinhard Bonnke is one of the greatest evangelists that has ever lived. So literally a million people get saved in one service. They've had four and five million people. And, and he has seen such miracles. And he said the changing point, the turning point in his life was the day that God spoke to him and he said, my word in your mouth is exactly as powerful as my word in my mouth. Come on. You say, why? Because God filled it with his power yeah. when he spoke it. When you speak it, it's still got the power. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's go to Isaiah 40, asking ourselves, who is this Holy Spirit who lives within us? Isaiah 40. And... Start right in the middle of everything, verse 12. Who has measured the waters and the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? 
Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor informed him? Who told God the Holy Spirit how to create the heavens and the earth? There wasn't anybody for him to look to. He didn't get online and, and see how you do it. He didn't ask the engineers. No, I'm not trying to be flint, but understand, this is the smartest person and more powerful person in the universe. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him in the way of understanding? You have the smartest person in the universe and the most powerful person in the universe inside you who oh, created man. everything. Isn't that wonderful? And to tell you the truth, this is bottom line, I'm skipping ahead, but he came to your life to create the, the life you would like to live. He, I don't care how far down you are, when you get saved, he systematically walks you out of your past to where the past doesn't matter, takes the scars off the past, the scars off the emotions. He undoes everything that holds you back, and then he takes you right into your destiny. Through Amen. That Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's look at Genesis 1, 1 to 3. Some of these are things you know. But you know, if we spend a whole Sunday saying, who is Jesus? We can have a wonderful time with him. He's, he's everything, right? But we need to know also who the Holy Spirit is. Genesis 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The other translation says hovering. What was he doing? It'd be easy to say he was doing nothing, but you know what he was really doing? He was waiting. He was waiting for verse 3. Yeah. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So what was the Spirit of God doing? He was waiting for God to speak. He's the muscle of God. He's the one who exercises and carries out the Word of God. In the Old Testament, he's also often called the arm of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is hovering over the face of your life this morning until you speak some creative Word of God, and he'll bring it to pass. And you say, isn't this a little far out? Let me ask you, how did you get born again? He, he's... There are islands of the sea that may never heard the gospel, but he's hovering over their hearts right now. And if they hear and they act, you'll be born again. He was on your, he was with you. He's with every human being alive right now. Until, the, until it's too late and that door slams shut, he's with every human being alive. He was with you before you got saved. It wasn't like he came to you and you got saved. It was when you acted on the word of God and said, I believe in my heart. And Jesus is the Son of God. You are my Lord. And when you said you are my Lord, you spoke the word of God and that creative life came yeah. to you and changed your destiny. Amen. Amen. You, you can see that in John 3, 5 to 6, that we've been born of the Spirit. And then we're going to see that Jesus was born in exactly the same way when he was born on earth. Of course, we know he pre existed. John 3, 5 to 6. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, I know you know that, but you have earthly parents, and then you have a heavenly parent. You have a heavenly father. Your body was born of your earthly parents, but your spirit was reborn. He, he has no grandchildren. He's not your granddaddy if your parents know the Lord. He's, he's your father. Because you were re-fathered of him. He says you were born again of the living word of God. So you received the new birth when you acted on the word of God. If you've ever been filled with the Holy Spirit, you got filled the same way. He's, he, every person in here is potentially baptized in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be baptized? Totally, completely immersed, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've already received this, this is what happened. You heard the word, you realized that this was for you, and you came to God and you said the, something along these lines. You said, Father, John the Baptist said that he would baptize in water, but there was one coming after him who would baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. And he pointed to Jesus. Four out of four Gospels say that Jesus is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit in fire. You check it out. Four out of four. And you come to him and say, I ask you, Lord Jesus, now to be my baptizer in the Holy Spirit in fire. Baptize me with your marvelous Holy Spirit. And then you yield your tongue and off you go praying in tongues and you have been received. You have received. But you see, the point is, you receive when you act on the word of God. Yeah. Jesus was born again when Mary said, Amen. That's good. I'm asking you to say amen to some stuff in your life you've never said amen to. Yeah. 
God has prophesied victory over your life. But, but you've got to say it. If you don't say it, you can still be defeated. Go to Luke chapter 1. It tells us exactly how God got the Son into the earth. Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel is speaking to Mary. The angel answered and said to her, we're in verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Do you know that's exactly what happened to you at the new birth? When you got born again and you said, I, I want to be saved, the Holy Spirit came upon you and overshadowed you and brought that word into existence. Are you following? Amen. Okay. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, the Holy Child shall be the Son of God. Now, at that moment, the Word of God has been spoken. There's a promise hanging in the air. Mary could have said, not on your life am I going to be an unwed mother. I they would kill me back home. She could have said, no thanks. Just like you would say, no thanks to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. Or whatever else it is. It's a promise. Thank God. Look at what you said in verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. You know what the word amen means? Amen means so be it. He said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll bear the Messiah. And she said, Amen. When you hear a, yes, yeah, so be it. When you hear a promise that Jesus would like to baptize you with more of the Holy Spirit than you've ever had before, so you'd be more, you know, you're more anointed after it, you got more of God. Yeah, yeah. You know what you need to say? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I wasn't sure I wouldn't say amen. It was the best decision I've ever made in my whole life. Go back to Matthew 1. Just to confirm what we I know we're teaching today, but faith comes by hearing. And I want you to leave here with enough faith to say, whatever it is that I need, I can take the promise and speak it and know that God is hovering over, God the Holy Spirit is hovering over my life to bring it to pass. Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with the child by the Holy Spirit. So we see that he was conceived by the Spirit. Verse 20. And Joseph, her husband, earth. But when she, he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in dreams. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child that you are has been conceived of the Holy Spirit. So here's my point. My point is just that Jesus, God spoke the word, Mary said yes, and the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. When a preacher told you, you can be saved because of the cross, and you said, yes, the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. Do you understand? He brought the new birth to pass. Every other thing you ever need from God, God is waiting upon you, hovering over your life, just as he hovered over the deep, waiting for somebody to say something that agrees with God. Now, the, the first thing we find out, I'm trying to rush this up here, the first thing we find out about God the Holy Spirit is that he is the creative power of God and he executes God's work. Amen? Number one. Number two, the Holy Spirit is the men, member of the Trinity who's present on earth today. He's the one we relate to. And Now, please to help you, I want to think about this again. If I could just bring Lord Jesus in here and put in all this glory, beautiful white raiment, Nail scars are still in his hands. And say, would you like to spend the afternoon talking to Jesus? I know you would say that. But when I say you can't, because of, uh, if, if we, we relate out to the Holy Spirit, you think, ah. In a way, it takes a little more effort. All right. Now, let me tell you something that happened to Jesse Duplantis. He, he got to see heaven. And I know people say, well, I don't believe it. He, there was a lot of reasons to believe he got to see heaven. He was preached. He, he was praying, and the Lord caught him up. When he went to service that night, he walked in a little bit late, and he didn't handle, uh, just wash his face and gone. He didn't look in the mirror or anything else. Evidently, the glory of God was still on him. As he walked in, the whole place went out of the power of God. He carried the heaven's glory with him. While he was there, he met a niece he didn't know he had, and his sister he had a miscarriage. And a little, little six-year-old girl came up and said, you're my Uncle Jesse. You tell Mama to quit crying. I'm okay. And he went back and said, Deborah, I met your fifth child. And she said, Jesse, you know I have four kids. He said, no, sir. 
you had a you had a baby that you never told me about. She said we lost it. And he said Jesus didn't lose that baby. Amen. She's growing up in heaven, just right, you know, learning the things of God. And she said to tell you to stop crying. Now these were things that were very easy to validate that he actually had been there. But when he was up there, an angel was asked to take him around, and as he walked around, he saw the throne of God, and he saw Jesus approaching the Father's throne, and he said, I've never seen love like that. You can't describe the love between the Father and the Son. And he's just sitting there, or standing there watching, he said to the angel, where's the Holy Spirit? And the angel said, on earth? Oh, he's not here. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one who came on the day of Pentecost. And so what I invite you to receive more of the Holy Spirit is simply the Spirit of Jesus. The spirit that Jesus sent to take his place. You can't say, I'd rather have Jesus. You'll get him in heaven. But right now, we relate to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yeah. Look at what it says in Revelation 22, 16 to 17. The very end of the Bible. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things to the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Some of these I've never done in other translations. I'm the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit of the bride say, come. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit. Who's the bride? Everybody raise your hand. We're the bride. Yeah. Where's the spirit in us? Yeah. And together, the spirit of God says, oh, he can hardly wait for the whole family to be together again. You, you ever have a, a family reunion where you've been scattered to the four winds, maybe the, the three continents, and they finally get back together? That's the way it's going to be when we get to heaven. The spirit says, come, Lord Jesus. And the bride says, Come. Why? Because now we're unified. We're one. And we should be one in every single thing we say this week with the, with the living word of God. Isn't that cool? This is good. Amen. Now John 16, 7, I will go back there, but he said it's to your advantage that I go. Now think about this. Let, let's look at John 14, 16 to 17. Because the world isn't going to see the Holy Spirit, but the Lord said you're going to know him. Now who are you going to believe? Your feelings or what the Lord said? Before. Let me tell you something, before I ever got healed supernaturally the first time, I had to believe it was real, even though I never received it. How many of you have ever received a supernatural divine, divine healing? Boom, just like that, a lot of people. John 14, 16, Jesus said, now why did the Holy Spirit come? He said, I will ask the Father. Why did the Holy Spirit come on the day of Pentecost? I'll tell you why. Because he knew those 12 disciples. He said, these guys need help. Look at Peter. Peter was in front of a little servant girl. And she says, I think you're one of them. Oh, no, no. And he's cussed. Three times. This is not, this is not going well for a church. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. He looked at them and he says, y'all need help. So I'm serious. Help. Yeah. So he said, I'm going to ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Thank God. That he will be with you forever. He will be with you in heaven. I'm so glad about that. If you ever get to know the Holy Spirit, you're so glad that he's not going to be out there and have He's always going to be in us. I like that. Next verse. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. You can't preach the Holy Spirit to the world because they can't even re recognize you're talking really about Jesus. We still, now the Spirit lifts Jesus up in our lives. Today we're talking about the Holy Spirit. This is whom the world cannot receive. It doesn't see him or know him. Now what are you going to do with that last part of the verse? Jesus told those who were disciplined to him, you know him because he's with you now as we talk and he will be in you. Oh. Now Jesus said we can know the Holy Spirit. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's good news. He said, why are you preaching this because it's in the Bible? I'm preaching this because years and years and years ago, I was in a church and we didn't exactly say God passed away, but everything about him had passed away. The gifts had passed away. What do you, if Aunt Eloise passed away, what does that mean? But if, Aunt, if you say, oh, my Aunt Eloise passed away, what does that mean? She died. Now, we didn't say God passed away, but we said all of his gifts passed away. His miraculous intervention passed away. We didn't have his presence and his services. We didn't, we thought his miracles passed away. And then one day, my grandma called me up and said, guess what? God didn't pass away. Well, oh, humans have to say it like that. We always love God. But I thought you had to wait on heaven, to heaven for everything. I thought you had to wait to get to know it. I thought you had to wait to get here from him. I thought you had to wait to see miracles. And we found, and now I want to tell you how we came into a place of being there instead of there. 
It's because we started believing the last half of that verse. Jesus said, you're going to know the Holy Spirit. He abides with him. He's going to be in you. She called me up one day and she said, Denise, I have received the Holy Spirit. I was news to me. I don't know what she's talking about. I said, that's great, Grandma. And I love my grandma. We were like this. All right? I spoke to my grandma and I don't care. This. She calls me up and calls me, guess what, Denise? God healed my psoriasis. And she had had that since I was, I couldn't remember a time her entire arm was psoriasis. They didn't have nothing to treat it. Guess what? The spiritual Catholic priest prayed for my psoriasis and it went. You say, you Catholic? It doesn't matter what you call yourself. What matters is, is that number one, you accept Jesus, and number two, you accept the Holy Spirit. You say, Can you show me that scripture? Yes. Go to um, Acts chapter 8. They were having a big revival. Acts chapter 8, we'll start at verse 4. This is right after, you know, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen stoned to death in the ranks of big persecution. So in verse 4, therefore, those who have been scattered because of persecution went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs that he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed were lame and healed, and there was much rejoicing in that city. Now, were they having a big revival? Yes. So down to verse 14. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to ask you something. If they had not received Jesus, would they have been baptized in the name of Jesus? Would Philip have baptized them in water if they had not been saved? No. So they had already received Jesus. And it says in verse 15, now, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what my grandma called and told me. She said, Denise. Well, our lives have been revolutionized. We have received the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand what that meant, but listen, you receive Jesus for your salvation, but you receive the Holy Spirit to have power to live. To, okay, look at verse 17. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a question. Did they receive the Holy Spirit after they had received Jesus? Yes. yes. Did the apostles in Jerusalem think this was important? It was so important they sent their top two men on a long, inconvenient journey because they said they don't dare get saved and not get the Holy Spirit because they won't make it. You remember what Peter looked like when he was serving God without the Holy Spirit? He was cussing and denying Christ. I mean, he was weak. But you know what happened when he, if you read Acts chapter 2, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he said, you men crucify the Lord of glory. He got up and preached, and 3,000 people got saved because all the fear left him. Yeah, I was the most fear-ridden person on the planet. Just, whoop, bad. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the funny part, I couldn't quit smiling for six months. Now, you know, you can wear a mask or something. You know. Why? Because I had found... Jesus that I'd always wanted to know. I mean, all I could think about was Jesus. He loves me exactly the way they said, only instead of just being a head knowledge, now I know it. I told you last week, some of the people on campus, there were 200 people on an 800 member campus that had received the Holy Spirit. They tracked me down and said, you got you speak in tongues. And I said, well, how do you know? I didn't advertise it because it wasn't popular at that time. So I thought, well, I've got one more year. I'll just keep it quiet to myself. They said, you speak in tongues. And I said, what makes you think that? This is what we do too. We know how it is. I have been rereading books from 40 years ago of an Episcopal, someone in the church knows an Episcopalian interest in the Lord. And I'm rereading They Speak With Other Tongues by John and Elizabeth Sherrill. They're intellectual Episcopalians who came at this with a great deal of skepticism. And they began to meet one person after another who not only spoke in tongues, but who had spoken in a known language. Harold Bredesen is in that book. It's so funny because I read it then, I didn't know him, but at CBN we got to know Harold. When Harold Bradison, who was also a Reformed pastor who got baptized in the Holy Spirit, he had gone up on a mountain, or up in, well, not really, in New Hampshire, so it was a really big hill up on Mount Lake Rockies. But he was up there all by himself, 
And he said, God, I'm not coming down until I speak in tongues. And, be, and within a week, he began to pray in another language. He was so excited, he went down the hills to tell somebody. And he couldn't quit, quit speaking in tongues. And his man began talking to him back. And so he was talking to him. And then the man went into English. And he said, how did you learn such beautiful Polish? And he said, I have no idea what I just said. And he said, well, you do too. You speak Polish. And I told you the other night about the, the rabbi that John and, John and Elizabeth Shrill were good friends with the rabbi in New York City who had quietly come to the Lord. And he was in great inner turmoil. Do I tell my friends that I've come to know Jesus? Or is this better to keep it quiet because I'm going to hurt people? He ended up on a vacation in Texas, and he was in a spirit-filled church. And he, they said, if you have a great need in your life, come forward. He was one of the people who came forward. They said, brother, what's your need? And he just shook his head. He wouldn't tell him. And they said, that's all right, brother. The Holy Spirit knows your need better than, than you do, so we will pray. They prayed for him in other tongues. And as they were praying in other tongues, one man's voice just seemed to lilt above the rest. And then there grew a hush. When they looked at uh, Rabbi, what was his name? I, I don't remember. The Rabbi... He was weeping. And he said, such beautiful Hebrew. I've never heard such beautiful. Who speaks the Hebrew? And this red that red-haired, <laughs> Irish Texan said, I'm an Irish Texan, but I was talking to you, but I don't know what I said. He said, that's his Hebrew, brother. He said, you told me my name. You told me my daddy's name. You said, Rabbi Ezekiel's son. He said, you wife, I came to Texas looking for answers. You said that I will go and I will introduce the Messiah to many of my people. Wow. You must speak Hebrew. And he said, no, I'm just a redneck, red-haired Irish Texan. Wow. And you see, over and over, as John and Elizabeth Sherrill, I, I'm not going to get that book in the bookstore. It has blessed me so much for reading it. As I read, they, they didn't come at it against it. They were just yeah. interested skeptics. And finally, one day, he couldn't hold out anymore. He said, those people have so much joy. I couldn't stand them having all the joy. And God filled him magnificently with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to ask. Because if I leave, you're going to be missing me back. But I'm gonna get, he's going to send somebody else. And this, this person is going to live. We see here in, in Acts chapter 8. The, the, the men, the leaders in Jerusalem said they've got to receive the Holy Spirit if they're born again. Look at Acts 1, 4 to 5. How many of you believe Jesus tells you the truth? Is he your Lord? Amen. Acts 1, 4, gathering them together. This is the day he ascended to heaven. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. Why? Why did they wait in Jerusalem? For John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now I have a question. Were these men already saved? Yes. If you go back, you want to see when they got saved? The day that he... You see, if you can get saved and later get filled with the Holy Spirit, we know it's two separate experiences. If you'll walk back to John 20, just a couple of main changes in your Bible. This is the day that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and appeared to them. John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And then he breathed, and when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And that was when they were born again. All right? And that was the very day he got saved. Forty days later, he went to heaven. Are we all together here? Forty days. So if you're in Acts chapter 1, between John 20 and Acts chapter 1, 40 days have passed. And he's telling them in verse 4, don't leave Jerusalem to the promise of the Father. What did he say? I'm going to ask, and he's going to send you another helper. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized. The Spirit, they were born of the Spirit then, but they got baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Look at one verse, or verse 8 of the same chapter tells why. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You shall be my witnesses. The baptism of the Holy Spirit enhances your life in every way, but it's really not for you. That's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to set you free from you so that you start witnessing to other people. Yeah. As long as I was saved, I truly love Jesus, and I could keep him so to myself. I could have been around a lot of people, they'd never know I was a Christian. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I tried to keep him to myself, because I knew that can't just believe him. 
Baptism. I couldn't. Are you kidding me? The living God is doing miracles. The living God spoke to me through the word this morning. I mean, hallelujah. 40 years later, I'm so happy. He's the living God. My parents have worked a lot with the Jewish people. A lot. They were ahead of something called Operation Exodus, and they helped right after the wall came down. They helped the Russian people emigrate by ship to Israel. And my father knows a lot of Jewish people, and he says so many of them are atheists. They won't tell you that unless you get to know them well. Now listen to my book. He says they feel so betrayed because for so many centuries they've looked for Messiah and they think he has not come. God didn't betray them. They missed him. Now listen. In a certain sense, in the good evangelical church that I was raised in, I as a child felt, felt a little bit of a sense of the betrayal. I want to explain why. I would read the Gospels and I think, what a wonderful Jesus. And Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. But I would never dare express this. I was a pastor's kid and I was loyal to my dad, but in my heart, I felt a slight sense of betrayal. Because our lives look absolutely nothing like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14. There's whole parts of the Bible we didn't dare ever read because our lives were not even in the same ballpark. And we were born again and we did love God. But you know what happened? When we got filled with the Holy Spirit, we just looked like the book of Acts all over again. We were having intense that they got together daily for prayer and fellowship. We couldn't, we were just together all the time. We were so excited. My little dog was the first miracle I ever saw. And you say, oh, you don't believe God healed. I know God killed him. I mean, we saw miracles. My, I don't know how much of this you want to hear. But I want to tell you something. I'm never going back. You said, what if you just had to go to a little Pentecostal church in a store? We did for 17 years. I didn't care. I didn't care. I love having a pretty place. I just want to be where God is. Amen. You want to hear how you healed my dog? My sister was 16 years old. Up in Massachusetts, everybody's Catholic. Catholic everybody. She was in a Baptist day school with about nine kids in high school. And she told them she spoke in tongues. I said, honey, you did. She said, yes, I did. I spoke in tongues. What's wrong with that? She said, you know what they said? And one day I came home and she was crying. She was talking to my mom and she said, they keep asking me, have you seen a miracle? And I have to say, no, I haven't seen a miracle yet, but I know God does miracles today. That Saturday night, this is before the day of emergency events, my dad was president of the university, they had gone to a big bank, but I, my, my first Pomeranian was a ball player. He would have played ball literally until he died of a heart attack. You just had to stop. He was a ball player. So he's like half grown. I have a small ball, about half the size of a tennis ball, rubber ball. I'm throwing it in the dining room. He's bringing it back to me late, about 10 o'clock on Saturday night. And my, my aunt had given my parents this dining room set and little tiny rungs on the chairs. And that dog went tearing with all the force of his body and snapped his jaw. So if his upper jaw is like this, and his lower jaw is like that, it should be like this, it's like that. And at that point in my life, I was unmarried, living at home, and that dog was my world. I had adored that little dog. And I was just delicious. I was so emotional. And right then, my parents walked in from the back room. And my dad took up this situation and he said, Denise, we have found that there is a God who answers prayer. Well, I, I'm not defending my case because there was real prayer. And so I woke Rusty, and my, we all get around the four of us. My little sister, who's 16, who's going to Baptist Day School, tell him she's fixing tongues. Never seen a miracle. This dog is my dog, okay? Always with me. That dog, as my father begins to pray, tears himself away from me, goes over to my sister across the room. And she's supporting, gingerly supporting this job. And I keep thinking, I'm so I'm in so much in faith, I'm thinking God would have sleep out of his misery because there's no emergency bed. Anyhow, what my father says, Father, in the name of Jesus, you know what this dog means to me. He's heal Rusty. And I heard my sister gasp, so I opened my eyes. And that dog sitting there grinning at me. And the job was completely silent. And then, after he got done, done grinning, he was six months old, not quite six months old. I had just bought him dog chow and puppy chow. Don't ever feed your dog dog chow. Back then, I know him better. Huge old dog chow. And this little Pomeranian is trying to. Sh he went over and started chomping dog chow, and I started to stop him. And, and, and my dad said, Well, Denise, if he healed him, you've got to let him be healed. And I said, Yeah, but what about this? 
And I had part of a piece of his, a little bone in his jaw and part of a piece of the tooth. Didn't believe it or not believe it. I said, what about this? Where does it fit? And we opened that little dog's jaw and it didn't fit. That dog was keeping it. And my sister, I mean, I'm pretty happy. I mean, I like animals to this day too much. I'm happy that my sister is just bawling. Oh, she says, I'll oh, tell them I've seen the miracle now. Hallelujah. And you see, that's fine. Uh, the dog even went over her. I didn't need the miracle. I've just been so immersed in the presence of God. She needed the miracle. I want to tell you something. God wants to do something in your life that you will never regret. And first of all, you, re you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you receive Jesus. But once you're born again, and there's a holy place inside for him to live. He invites you to receive him in his power and his fullness. And all kinds of other stuff. I was reading, this is just an interesting point for all of you who already knew everything else that was in this sermon. Some of you did. I love it, really, God. You know how it says that Philip went down and he led the Ethiopian unit to the Lord? You know, it says the Spirit told him to go. Then it says the Spirit caught him away and he ended up in another town and started preaching there, right? He got translated. Yeah. Did you know that twice Elijah was accused to be, evidently Elijah was translated more than one occasion because I can show you twice that they, first of all, oh, I don't mind going into this. I just love the Word of God. This is exciting. If he can translate you, what can he do? Do you want to see something really cool in 1 Kings? That he goes and the Lord says, go show yourself to Ahab. It's going to be the end of the drought. 1 Kings 18.7. Now, Zobadiah was on the way. Behold, Elijah met him and he recognized him. He fell on his face and said, is this you, Master Elijah? So Elijah said, yeah, go tell your master that I am going to show up. And can you go down to about verse? Behold, Elijah's here next verse. What sin have I committed that you're gonna you're giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? The Lord, as the Lord your God lives, no nation or kingdom where my master is sent to search for you. And when they said it's not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they couldn't find you. Now look what he thinks is gonna happen. Now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, the light is here. Now watch this. And it'll come about when I leave. The Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I don't know, and then I'll go tell Ahab and he'll kill me. Isn't that funny? But the same thing happened. Do you remember how he actually was taken to heaven by a whirlwind? Yeah. Look, at, you know what the, pro, the sons of the prophet said? Go to 2 Kings 2, 16 to 18. After he goes to heaven in a whirlwind, as they were going, they said to him, this is uh, the sons of the prophet speaking to Elisha, Behold, now there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and search for your master, for perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken them up and cast him on some mountain. Or well, and he said, no, you won't. He finally let him go, but you know he went to heaven. Here's my point. In the Old Testament, they saw such magnificent miracles that, what was it that God couldn't do? Who is it that lives within you? The one who created everything. We shouldn't be amazed that miracles are, are happening. We should be amazed when they aren't happening. Look, um, I got way too much here. I know that when Gabriel came to Mary and said, you better bury, uh, bury the Messiah, Mary could have respectfully said, no, she'd still be in heaven. But she wouldn't be one of the most honored women that ever lived. She had to say that. Right now, God the Father and God the Son are offering you the second most valuable gift you will ever receive in your life. I exaggerate not. The most precious gift you'll ever receive is the gift of salvation. You yeah. receive Jesus. But after that, until you receive the Holy Spirit, this is the only person that doesn't qualify. If you can look me in the eye right now and say, Pastor, I don't need more power. Pastor, I'm not hungry for more. Then I will admit you don't qualify. But if there's something in you that says, I want all the power God has. You know, Moses just said, oh, that all of you people were anointed. That's the cry of God's heart today. Oh, that all my people would receive all the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you know, I'll be honest with you, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm too happy. Hallelujah. But the fullness of the Holy Spirit, there's plenty, let me explain this, and then we're just going to sing a song, and if you can forward, we'll pray for you. There's places in God 
that you know exist and you can't get there without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's things you need to say to the Lord. There's just a frustration at the end of prayer where you just wish you could explain things. And it comes through praying in tongues. The heavenly language is a code language between you and God. Most of the time it's not a human language because the, the Lord doesn't want the enemy to understand it. He wants you to pray to him secret. Christians, we need to use that every day of our lives. You say, Pastor, did you know there's like 50 subjects you could have talked about today that would not have been talking about? Yeah, I know that. And you say, Pastor, why do you go right out on a limb and tell about the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you know you can talk about the second coming, you can talk about healing, we don't share it. Look, listen, listen, I'm going to tell you why. Because without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I love God and I couldn't make it happen. My life didn't look like mine. I just couldn't make it happen. How many of you just, how many of you at least say, I am hungry for more of God? Yeah. Now, if you're not hungry for more of God, I want to go forward to communion prayer. <laughs> if you are hungry for more of God, you say, well, I want more of God. But I'd like him to please follow this prescription. Guess what? <laughs> you ain't God. You know, who asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Who sent the Holy Spirit? The Father. He, he said, wait for the promise of the Father. Amen. I've had people come in and they say, I feel the presence of God in your services. How many of you feel the presence of God? I want to tell you how we got from the little storefront of Pentecostal Church to the old Sunderland to here. We prayed around the altar in the Holy Spirit and we prayed out the plan to God. When we were there, almost ready to jump here, I saw something and I saw it really clearly. You know what? We're going to get this nice building and all of a sudden we're going to become a lot more respectable. And with becoming respectable is going to come the temptation to not offend. I was offended when my grandma told me she'd receive the baptism. But thank God she loved me enough to keep praying for me for you when I got it. I don't care if you're offended with me, but please ask yourself, when they had a revival in Samaria, did they receive Jesus and get baptized in water? Yes. Why did the leaders in Jerusalem, why were they so concerned that they sent them on a very inconvenient journey? Because they knew they needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If it's, in, if it's in the Bible, and you know you want more of God, and it's in the Bible, and you know you want a stronger prayer life, and it's in the Bible, and you wish you had more joy, and I'll tell you what happened to me. I didn't become a super saint overnight, but I sure had joy. I was the most exciting two years of my life after I got the baptism. I was so happy. And it still comes up now when I think, well, I just forget how bad it used to be. It's so good. It's so good to know God. It's so good for God to speak. I know what's happening in this church and what's going to happen. I say, God's arrogant. It's not, but according to the Bible, he said he'll show you things to come. We just have to know him. It makes sense to say to Jesus, the disciples said, who in the world is this? But I ask you this morning, why don't you say that about the Holy Spirit? Who in the world are you who have come to live within me? And do you want more of me? And am I supposed to want more of you? You say, what will happen if I let you pray for me or somebody else pray for you? Well, according to the Bible, Jesus himself will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now, when, when you get baptized and wander around here, we don't like take it and go. Because baptism, the word in the Greek means immersion. It means immerse. It also represents burial. And so we dunk you, right? Yeah. You don't sprinkle dirt on a corpse. You bury him. Yeah. Now, if you're going to get buried in God, uh, if you're going to get immersed in God, that just means that he's going to take you and he's going to keep pouring and pouring uh, and pouring. I always wanted to plant it for that, huh? 
the stuff I just poured on the carpet. I used to have a whole pitcher out here. He's going to take just a whole pitcher of water and just keep pouring, and you're going to have so much God on you that you will never keep it to yourself again. Now, if that's not good, I don't know what's good. Oh, let your good spirit leave us, David. So let's, let's pray. Father, I told you what your word says. And Lord, those who have received the baptism, we give a hundred percent consensus. It's the second best thing that ever happened. We're so grateful. I just pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you are strong witness to this heart, strong hunger, a divine dissatisfaction that will never be satisfied until they receive all of it there is. We love you so much. Thank you for coming, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for bearing with us in all of our foibles and idiosyncrasies. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our great comfort. Can I show you one last verse? I'm supposed to let you go on time. Second Corinthians 13. You got a verse there in Second Corinthians 13? I'll tell you the other reason that I'm so glad I got filled with the Holy Spirit. The only one in Second Corinthians, I think, if you have it there. It says, May the love of God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Maybe it's first but yes. Second hmm. Corinthians 13, 14. Read it with me. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. How many of you believe in the grace of Jesus? Do you believe in the love of God? Yeah. Or do you believe in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? I want to tell you something. My son and daughter are going to be fellowshipping over a red skin Steeler game. <laughs> they got it planned out. They're getting Chinese food because they're on a diet. So they're going to have instead they got to have Chinese food, and there's going to be a lot of good natured ribbing. How she got to be a Steelers fan, I never know. But I imagine if your dad's upset, he's over that. All right. They're going to have some good fellowship. What are just good hanging time? This part. The Bible says, Paul prayed, made the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You know the best thing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit takes away your loneliness. You come to know him, and you enjoy life with him. Amen. He speaks to you. He'll, he'll point things out to you. You're doing wrong. Keep you from costing yourself money. He's wonderful. So we're going to sing a song. If you want to be filled with spirit, come on up. <laughs>